Okay, so in today's video, we're going to do a little bit of, in general, plant information. A little bit about, you know, plant structure, some things they had to overcome to be able to move on to land. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about transpiration so that you're ready to start your lab. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to talk about is characteristics of land plants in, in general. Okay, so for it to be a land plant, okay, it's got to be eukaryotic. Okay, you know, plants have membrane-bound organelles. Because remember, land plants came after plants, you know, everything started in the water. And they had to be able to move on to land. And so there are some certain characteristics that they have to have to be able to be successful on land. And we'll talk in a little bit about um, kind of how these things came about. Okay, so the second one is they've got to be an autotroph. Okay, so to be a land plant, they have to be an autotroph. And hopefully you guys remember that autotrophs make their own food, right? They're self-feeding, so they have to be eukaryotic, they have to be an autotroph, they have to have a cell wall made of cellulose, okay? Not, having a cell wall is not special to land plants, but having a cell wall made out of cellulose is, okay? They also do what's called alternation of generation, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay. Basically, it's the fact that they have a both a haploid and a diploid um, generation. They alternate between the two of them. Okay. And then they also are embryophytes. They have a protected embryo. Okay. Commonly, we think about it with um, <laughs> you know seeds and fruits. Okay. But they have a protected embryo, so they're an embryophyte. And so let's talk about what this alternation of generations is. Okay, so this is an overview of our alternation of generations. Y'all don't know, need to know tons and tons of detail of this. You really just need to kind of get an understanding of it. So one of the things you need to realize is that they're going to be alternating between both a haploid and a diploid generation. Okay, if you think about it, we do not do that. You know, we don't have a baby that's haploid and then that baby has diploid babies. Okay, we don't alternate between the two, but plants do. Okay, and so let's start over here, okay, and so what we have over here is what's called the gametophyte, okay, and so the gametophyte is, we're going to look at a picture of it uh, in just a minute, but the gametophyte is going to be haploid, okay, and we're going to follow a fern uh, cycle in just a minute, okay, so the gametophyte is going to be a haploid generation, and it's actually going to make gametes by mitosis, okay, because normally you know, when you think of um, making gametes, uh, you think of meiosis, and we cut the chromosome number in half, and we produce the gametes. But if you realize here, we're already, the chromosomes are already cut in half. We're at a haploid generation already. So they're going to make gametes by doing mitosis. And then those gametes will fuse, will have fertilization. So once those gametes fuse, now we've got a diploid cell here. So we have this zygote that is diploid. And that zygote will go through mitosis, just like it would if you were talking about an animal example. Okay, so that zygote will go through mitosis, and it is the sporophyte. Okay, so the sporophyte generation is a multicellular diploid organism. When we're talking about some of our other plants like gymnosperms and angiosperms, if you're talking about roses or fruit trees, okay, the dominant generation, the one that you see, is the sporophyte generation. It is the diploid cells, diploid multicellular organism. Okay? And so that sporophyte, that sporophyte is going to actually go through meiosis. It's going to produce haploid spores. Okay? And so those spores, they're going to germinate and they're going to divide. And when those spores divide, they form the gametophyte. Okay, so you've got two phases here. You've got a, The things that Carolyn really wants you guys to hone in on here is that you've got this gametophyte versus a sporophyte. The gametophyte being haploid, the sporophyte being diploid. The gametes are made by myto mitosis. Okay, when they fuse, I get my sporophyte that then goes through mitosis also to grow. Okay. Meiosis doesn't occur until we're producing spores, and we're going into that haploid generation to make the gametophyte. Okay. It would make sense that the gametophyte is a haploid. Okay. And then that um, those spores 
will divide through mitosis to make the multicellular gametophyte. Okay, and so it'll just keep going back and forth. It'll alternate between being a sporophyte and being a gametophyte. And then a sporophyte again and a gametophyte. And a sporophyte and a gametophyte. Okay, so it just goes back and forth. So we're going to kind of go bit by bit through the fern life cycle to take a look at this. Okay, so if I look at this down here at the bottom, okay, this is, down here, this is my sporophyte. So this one is going to be diploid, okay, and these are the spores right here. Okay, so I'm going to release these spores. So I had to go through meiosis here to get these down to haploid. Okay, so this diploid sporophyte went through meiosis to produce the haploid spores. Okay, and so from those haploid spores, okay, now I've got the gametophyte generation. Remember my gametophyte is haploid, but it was able to grow here by doing mitosis. Okay, so it was able to grow there by doing mitosis. Okay, and so over here, we've made gametes. And again, it, these gametes are going to be haploid, but they were made also by mitosis. Okay, so you can see here, okay, I've got fertilization is going to happen. And so when fertilization happens, I'm bringing two haploid gametes together, so I should end up with back at my sporophyte. So as I complete the cycle here, Okay, after fertilization, my sporophyte will grow using mitosis, okay, and it will start all over again. So I was alternating back and forth between the gametophyte haploid and the sporophyte diploid generation. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the adaptations that land plants would have had to overcome. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at here are the fact that there are four different um, groups or categories of land plants. And okay, we've got non-vascular plants, which are also called bryophytes. And we're going to talk about each one of these individually. Okay, I've got non-vascular plants, which are bryophytes, seedless vascular plants, which are pterophytes, uh, ferns, okay, gymnosperms, which are... Um, as a general rule, um, the seed is, encode, is um, on a cone, okay? they're naked seeds. And then angiosperms, which are flowering plants. So all of these, um, these are a monophyletic group. If y'all remember what that means, hopefully you do. Okay? Monophyletic groups are uh, groups where they have a unique common ancestor. Okay? So they have a unique common ancestor that all four of these groups share Okay, and they don't share it with any other organism. Remember, the, our way of defining the monophyletic um, group was the ancestor and all of its descendants. Okay, this is the same thing. Okay, I've got a group that have a unique common ancestor. Nobody else shares that ancestor. That would go right along with having the um, ancestor and all of his descendants. Okay, so let's look at some of these land adaptations. Okay, so some of the land adaptations that plants, um, basically plants evolved to help them survive on land was a cuticle. Okay, so remember we've got that waxy covering that helps prevent dehydration. Okay, um, they also needed to be able to do gas exchange. If they couldn't do gas exchange, then they couldn't do photosynthesis. Okay, so they had to be able to do gas exchange. So the, that need led to our stomata, and what are called lenticels. Okay, they also need to be able to get water. Okay, they need to be able to get water and minerals. And due to that need, they had to develop roots. Okay, so they needed a root system to be able to do that. Okay, as they got on land, they um, started to increase, to be able to increase in size, to be able to get larger. Okay, they needed to develop um, xylem, uh, in particular xylem with what's called lignin, which offered extra support okay, to that xylem 
to be able to um, hold the plant up and to be able to transport water. Okay. They also had to be able to reproduce without water. Okay. They needed to overcome that. They needed to be able to have a, um, they be able to have sperm that was not, uh, did not have a flagellum associated with it and did not have to swim. So they had to uh, figure out, they had to adapt and be able to reproduce without water. Hence you get the fruit and the flowers and the cones for wind pollination. Okay. And then they also had to be able to prevent the embryo from dehydrating. Which again goes back to when I talked about they were embryophytes in the sense that they had a uh, protected embryo. And part of that was to prevent the embryo from dehydrating. Okay, so let's look a little bit closer at the four different types of plants. We're going to start with the oldest one, which would be our bryophytes. Okay, so our bryophytes, which are also our non-vascular plants. Okay, um, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so these are non-vascular plants, which means they don't have xylem, they don't have phloem, they don't have vascular tissue. And so due to that fact, that's a huge limiting factor in size. Because you don't have vascular tissue, you can't transport things throughout the, um, throughout the plant very well. And you don't, have, um, you don't have the support you need to grow in size. But your biggest limiting factor here with size is going to be, like I said, that lack of transport. They have to live somewhere where water is readily available. Okay, so water has to be readily available. So in these plants, the sporophyte generation okay, is actually dependent upon the gamete, the gametophyte, and it stays attached. Okay, so the sporophyte generation is dependent upon the gamete and stays attached to the gametophyte and stays attached to the gametophyte. So like I said, that gametophyte is going to provide nutritional support to the sporophyte, which you'll notice is going to be totally different as plants continue to evolve. Okay. Um, so examples of these would be things like mosses, uh, what are called liverworts, that's an R. And that is supposed to be an O. Okay. And uh, hornworts. So after your bryophytes came your seedless vascular plants. And your seedless vascular plants, examples of these would be uh, horsetails, ferns, Okay, they're also called pteraphytes. You saw that on the uh, monophyletic tree there. Okay, so your seedless vascular plants, they're a step ahead of your bryophyte in the sense that they do have this vascular tissue. So they can be significantly larger because they don't have to, um, they're able to transport the water. Okay, so they can be significantly larger. There's, in these, your sporophyte now is your dominant generation. The gametophyte generation in ferns is very, very small. Okay, so your sporophyte, um, your di which remember is diploid. Okay, so your sporophyte or your diploid generation is dominant. And if you remember in your bryophytes, okay, your gametophyte was dominant. The sporophyte was nutritionally dependent upon the gametophyte. So the sporophyte is your dominant generation. However, you'll notice these are seedless vascular plants. So they, so they still have... A, a sperm with a flagellum. So to be able to reproduce, water has to be a bit available. Okay, the sperm has to actually swim to reach the eggs of the of the other plant, okay, to, or to be able to reach the eggs in general. So they have to have um, they still have to have water to reproduce because of the sperm. But like I said, they're they can be significantly larger. Okay, from here, our next step, we went to gymnosperms. Okay, so our gymnosperms came after the seedless vascular plants. Okay, and so these are what are called naked seeds. Okay, they are not enclosed in an ovary. 
So their seed is not surrounded 